I am thrilled to be hosting this program today. I've been looking forward to it for two reasons. One is the report, BRI Implications for the United States, is really, really, really important. And, it's, and it forced me, hosting the program forced me to really focus on it and read every page of it, which was really fun and interesting and actually, actually exciting. Uh, second is we have an incredibly illustrious panel today, including, I think for the first time, uh, our new chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, former Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Liu, who's participating in a public program as opposed to running something that is, that is closed. So first, welcome, Jack. Welcome to the first uh, public program you're doing for us, hopefully one of many, many more to come. Uh, we thanks, also thanks, have... Steve. Good to be here with my dual capacities. It's great. And we also have you know, three other panelists who's, if I went over all of their accomplishments in their career, we wouldn't have, have any time for the program. They all, you have their bios on the, on the website. Um, so I would just urge you to read them, but just, you know, Admiral Ruffhead, uh, not only was chief of naval operations, but to my knowledge, was the only person who both commanded the Atlantic and the Pacific fleets. So that's there, was, there was one other. Um, so I, I consider that a high honor. I, it is, it is. And we, we thank you for, for your service there. And Jennifer Hillman, who is now senior fellow at, this, at Council on Foreign Relations and is teaching at Georgetown uh, Law School and is somebody who I rely on when I want to kind of know what's going on in the international trade sector. After a career at USTR, she then was at the, uh, at the ITC and then, the, and then I think the appellate court of the WTO. So really somebody who knows um, you know, the ins and outs of international trade. And then David Sachs, who is a research fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. And I guess with Jennifer was responsible for, for writing this terrific report. And I have to say to everybody who's on this call, it is a must read. Don't just stop with the executive summary. The executive summary is fabulous. It kind of gives you the overview. But then when you go into the details, and in my case, even going into the footnotes to see where a lot of these things came from, it was, it's really, really interesting. And it, and it sheds light on something which is not that well understood uh, in the United States. And the word I would use to characterize it is fair and balanced, that this report really is something that the Council on Foreign Relations specializes in doing is putting out a report that educates, that's fair, that is balanced. So let's kick it off. I guess Jack is gonna speak first, then Gary, then Jennifer, then David, and then I'll ask um, a bunch of questions. We already have a bunch of great questions, um, but if you have any you wanna raise during this, please do. We want this to be interactive. But um, I don't have to say that, that Jack was the, the 76th Secretary of the United States Treasury. So uh, in addition to being chairman of the National Committee, but we'll, we'll, we won't say which is more important. Okay, Jack, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and uh, it really is a pleasure to be here uh, to present uh, our task force report and uh, to do the first uh, public event uh, since I took over as chairman of the committee. You know, it's important to know what a CFR task force is. Um, you know, it's an independent, uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan group. This one had 24 people with wide ranging backgrounds from business and government and academics. Um, and uh, it was really designed to be a deep dive into a subject that we thought was very important, but really had not been studied with the kind of rigor that it deserved. Um, and the team that we have here today was terrific to work with, uh, and uh, David and Jennifer uh, get a lot of credit for the research and the almost 400 footnotes that went into the report. Um, and I say that uh, not just as a, as a joke, but it was very important to us that this report be substantiated, not based on either uh, innuendo or, or rumors or supposition, but that it be based on uh, data uh, in a world where there is no single repository of data and gathering the information took an extraordinary amount of research. Um, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, you know, President Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy undertaking. 
Uh, making sense of it um, is critical to understanding China's broader uh, ambitions uh, in terms of foreign policy, national security, and economic policy. And it has implications for the United States in many regards. Um, the, the work didn't begin uh, by saying BRI is a bad thing. It actually began by saying BRI was directed at meeting a good uh, range of unmet needs in infrastructure, in healthcare, in, 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 in technology. The question that we were looking at was as China you know, put this program into effect, um, creating a, a, a network of commercial and uh, financial relationships, um, was the impact one that caused more problems than it did create solutions? Were the costs greater than the benefits? We reached the conclusion that both for the United States and the broader global community, the, the, the risks and costs are very substantial. And actually, if you take a snapshot, outweigh the benefits. And then the question is, then what do you do? Um, you know, the, 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 the first challenge was defining BRI. And uh, BRI is no, no longer just an infrastructure initiative. Um, with the technology projects and the health projects, it's really uh, become quite broad in scope. You know, the scope of it is uh, almost um, uh, global. Uh, it, there are 139 countries, 19 in Latin America, 45 in Africa, 28 in Europe. Um, and um, in some ways, it's more of a Chinese branding uh, exercise than an institution. It's the activities of China's commercial banks, state-owned for the most part, um, lending uh, as much as it is government agencies uh, entering into uh, formal decisions. And it's also opaque. The contracts are by requirement kept confidential. So looking behind each of the transactions, uh, it, it, you know, it takes a good deal of investigation. So what are some of the conclusions that, that we reached? Um, you know, first, we see much of the success as coming from a void that the United States and allies of the United States left. And when we get to the recommendations, a lot of the recommendations are about filling that void with affirmative policy. Um, we concluded that despite a BRI's potential for meeting longstanding needs, um, it has done an awful lot uh, that create risks ranging from global macroeconomic stability uh, with increased likelihood of debt crises, you know, displacement of non-Chinese uh, businesses, including American businesses, from doing uh, trade business on a fair basis, locking countries into uh, technology and standards that are Chinese and that we and other countries have less of a say over. Um, you know, increased difficulty in reducing carbon emissions because so much of the funding has gone into coal-fired power plants, which have not short lives, but 50-year lives. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 the standards for business practices um, don't meet uh, either U.S. or international financial institution standards. So it's created pockets of, you know, corruption um, and uh, destabilization in uh, areas where it's exactly the opposite that you would want for stability. Um, so, you know, why do countries sign up? Uh, they, they sign up because they have needs and China was there to meet the needs. So when we get to the solutions, the solutions are making sure that countries understand what their choices are. Is something as simple as technical support so that they understand the financing term. You know, secondly, making sure that U.S. and uh, international funding sources are aimed at meeting the needs that countries have. You know, having the U.S. re-engage and participate in standard setting in important areas like technology and engaging more globally on health policy. And on areas where our interests are hopefully not contradictory, finding ways to work together like climate change, where uh, even in the difficult meetings in Anchorage, the one area coming out of it where there's some ongoing cooperative effort is on climate change. 
if that is viewed as not just addressing what China does within China, but applying to China's activities in its Belt and Road Initiative, that would actually make a big difference. We have a host of uh, other um, recommendations, uh, including re-engaging in things like you know, the TPP trade agreement. Um, but rather than go through uh, those, I'm just gonna close with a fundamental uh, concern of, that we address in the recommendations is the US investing domestically, investing in research and development, investing in people, having immigration policies that address the needs we have for people with skills, because fundamentally, the US ability to compete is about having that edge and um, being engaged. So we see the solutions as falling in a place that plays to American strengths, you know, being uh, at the cutting edge of technology and, and, um, and, and commercializing technology is a US strength working with global alliances is a US strength. Um, you know, we obviously started this project at, the, at a time when there was one administration, we ended it at a time with a new administration. And um, you know, we think the recommendations come at a very important time as US policy is being rethought. Yeah, that, the last few sentences sounded like Biden's speech to Congress the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Ruffhead. Steve, thank you very much. And um, I won't take up a lot of time, but I would also like to uh, just say how uh, uh, much a pleasure it was to work with the task force, superb collection of people. And I can't say enough about David and Jennifer, their research, uh, the brilliant pens that they wielded in, in crafting uh, what we thought was important to talk about. And as Jack mentioned, uh, it really was important to all of us that we that we talked about uh, facts uh, as opposed to opinions or strongly held beliefs or or echoes of of claims that were being made. And uh, David and Jennifer were just superb in that. I think it's also important to recognize, and I know many of you have participated in initiatives like this. When you bring twenty four people together to produce uh, a statement and you don't have any dissenting uh, opinions or comments, I think that that speaks well for, for how the group came together and how we looked at things. Uh, obviously, um, you know, my, my life has been spent in the security realm. And I think in many instances, a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative has been captured or at least the, the, the bumper sticker has been about uh, the ports, the brick and mortar that's being put in place. And, and I think uh, one of the things that the report uh, points out, and I would also encourage those of you who are reading it to, to, to not just read the, the paper copy, but really to be able to go online because you can get a lot of information about port ownership and, and, and other things. And I would encourage that. But, but on the ports, uh, you know, the idea that this is the, the, the precursor of an expanded PLA Navy that will roam the globe and use all of the ports to support their operations, I think it's important uh, to consider that all ports are not created equal. Uh, you know, modern container port is not going to be able to accommodate and support uh, naval force structure in ways that purpose-built bases are. Uh, that said, there are some ports that I think um, uh, can be used uh, for naval operations. But uh, I think it's worth uh, thinking about it in, in, in what the, the, the ports are, are designed to do. And I would also encourage everyone to think more broadly about China's emergence as a global maritime power. Uh, the United States is, a, is the global naval power. There is no one that can touch us. But China has really emerged as a global maritime power with the ports, its shipping companies, its ship construction, its ship financing, the world's largest distant ocean fishing fleet. And, and, and there's a maritime dimension to what China is doing um, that, that I think will have impact for years to come. Um, but on the topic of ports, as Jack mentioned, there are, there are second and third order effects. Um, the ports, even though they may not be able to support a, 
a, a naval operation, if you will. Um, we use those ports to flow logistics through for operations in which we may be involved. The modern ports today generate a lot of data and information that can be used either for market analysis, but it can also be used to do an analysis of, you know, what are we flowing? What are the types of things that are coming through the ports? And by ownership, part ownership and operational control, there can be fingers put on the scales of how efficient that port could be in a time of, of crisis or conflict. Um, there's a, a lot of information that can be gathered. For example, the port in Haifa uh, is proximate to Israel's main naval base, a place where our ships go to visit. So what are the types of, uh, of, of information gathering that can go on? What is the maritime infrastructure that springs up around that port that can show there's an American ship in port and it's having maintenance done. And, th and there are things that, that go beyond just the, the physical image of what you see there. On the broader issue of security, um, there's no question, I think, that we have to think about security very differently. And it no longer is just uh, what is the size of one military force compared to the other but the environment in which we will operate, others will operate, operate particularly the digital environment is, is significant. And the digital ecosystems that are being built in countries that are important to us, and as Jack mentioned, standard setting bodies are, are, are being influenced by China, but just the volume of Chinese uh, telecommunication equipment or 5G uh, equipment, that is, is influencing standards as well. And so I think we need to be mindful about that. Uh, Jack also mentioned uh, the investments that China is making in power. Um, you know, as, a, as a middle classes rise in these developing countries, power is essential. And China is filling that need, not just in generation, but also in modern distribution systems. And so how are those systems controlled and, and what information is being gleaned from those? And I think that that's important. And the other point that we mentioned um, is the amount of information that's moving around the world on undersea cables. Uh, almost the, the, the entirety of that information is moving on undersea cables, very little through um, uh, satellites. And so what are the locations of the, the cables? Where are, do the cables terminate? Do they terminate near or in a Chinese controlled port and does that give um, China or the port operator access to that information much easily gleaned by being able to tap into those uh, you know, lines of communication that are taking place? So uh, when we looked at security, we wanted to look more broadly um, and, and look more deeply at what really is creating the security infrastructure uh, of, the, of the future digital world that we're going to live in. And I look forward to your questions. So I'll just stop there. Uh, Jennifer? Sure, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you. And I'll just add just a very few comments because I think we all would, would welcome your question. I'll only say one of the other things that is unique about this report is that it's the first look at BRI in a post COVID world. So a lot of what we tried to understand is how has COVID shifted the focus of BRI and what is to come, because there's no question as you look at the data, the sheer volume of BRI lending has come down very substantially, significant number of projects that were either delayed or stopped, and, and that, was that was directly related to COVID. In part, that's because an awful lot of the work in the major infrastructure projects is being done by Chinese labor, and so you started to have an issue of not being able to move that labor as a result of COVID. A lot of the raw materials that were being used to build a lot of this infrastructure, again, coming out of China. So as you started to see COVID restrictions on the movement of those goods, you started to see a decline. But what we clearly saw and document very clearly in the report happened is that China pivoted. Uh, the entire sort of BRI project, if you will, pivoted to one that is heavily focused on technology. And it's focused on technology across sort of a number of areas, but the major ones that we highlight would be in the telecommunications sector, 
where you clearly see it's not just Huawei and 5G, but it's across the broad range of the creation of smart cities and smart grids and the use of, uh, of again, telecommunications technology, uh, uh, again, in, across a very wide range. The second area where there's no question it has, BRI has really pivoted is into the space of financial technology. Uh, again, particularly in the area of electronic payments, where China is now going into many of these BRI countries that have a large portion of their population that is unbanked or has no access to traditional sort of bricks and mortar type of banking arrangements and is again, using that financial technology to again, sign up uh, millions, if not, we're at now with, with, uh, with um, Alipay 1.3 billion uh, consumers that are logged on to that Alipay app or are using, again, Chinese technology as their only form of, of financial services transactions. And the third area where we've clearly seen this pivot is into the creation of a health Silk Road, where China has used, um, again, its connections into the BRI countries and that BRI umbrella uh, to do a whole lot of things, uh, starting with its sort of mask diplomacy, where it was, again, very, very involved in providing uh, masks and PPE equipment and other kinds of supplies, again, largely to its BRI, uh, country suppliers. And then more recently, we've seen it move very heavily into the notion of vaccine diplomacy. Uh, as China started to try to develop its own vaccines, it realized it was at a point where it did not have uh, enough, uh, if you will, of its own citizens to test on. So again, it did a lot of its vaccine testing uh, in its BRI uh, country uh, you know, affiliates partly in exchange for a promise that then those vaccines would be made available. So again, you are now seeing China heavily engaged in providing significant amounts of vaccines into 39 countries, um, you know, again, virtually all of whom are its BRI, are BRI parties. So we are starting to see, again, this real pivot to a, a te telecommunications, electronic and health Silk Road. Uh, but, but to me, that also underscores the basic fact that Jack was saying, this is not going to go away. So whatever the United States' response needs to be to BRI, it needs to understand uh, that in whatever form it is, it is here and it is here to stay, and that we need, we need to be able to also pivot to respond to this newly revised form of, of BRI that's more heavily on the tech side than on the bricks and mortar infrastructure side. Great, David. Sure, well, thanks again for having us, and I'll be very brief so we can get to uh, the Q&A, but just taking a step back, I think that there's a, the question of, well, why did China pursue BRI when it has um, its own domestic needs? And how does this make sense for China to be spending billions of dollars developing uh, markets in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, South Asia? And um, I think it's BRI is consistent with Chinese foreign policy writ large, which is really that Chinese foreign policy in many ways is an extension of its domestic priorities and agenda. And so if you look at BRI, uh, one of the motivations was that it could help close the gap between China's uh, relatively affluent coastal cities and its more impoverished interior, and that in turn that would help boost uh, domestic political stability. Also, as we all know, China has tremendous uh, excess manufacturing capacity, whether we're looking at high-speed rail, which we get into in the report, or steel or coal. And uh, BRI, of course, helped it find new markets for that excess capacity. We also know that China has uh, a significant accumulated savings, and BRI allowed uh, primarily you know, CDB and Exim Bank to move into these markets. And as we also go into the trade element of BRI, um, it allowed China to secure a consistent source of inputs for its manufacturing sector and also really work to shift or reorient global commerce towards China and make China the, the center or hub of commerce in many ways. So if you look at BRI through the lens of why would China do this, what's in it for China, because clearly it wasn't uh, done out of altruism, I think that BRI makes a lot of sense um, if you look at it in the context of Chinese foreign policy more broadly. Great. Well, that's a perfect segue into my first question. Jack, you said the risks and costs outweigh the benefits. I assume you meant that for the United States. The question I would have is what about for China and for their the BRI countries? Have they benefited from this? So 
we we actually looked beyond the United States and, and the conclusion that we drew is that it, it leave China aside for the moment, um, but for the BRI countries and for the United States and our traditional allies, um, the spillover of, of risk uh, and, and, and uh, damage that flowed from some of the, the activities was greater than the benefits. You look inside uh, the countries, you know, if you need um, a, a big uh, uh, infrastructure project, uh, ideally, you would be building a labor force, you would be having uh, uh, an impact on the community that was generally positive. Um, you know, there was virtually no indigenous labor used uh, in, in the projects that were funded. It was Chinese labor, so it didn't have any of that secondary benefit. So countries went deep into debt to pay for, you know, China to provide projects, and then they're left with communities that are suffering in some ways from the after effects and debt that even before COVID was a risk, but that by COVID got accelerated. So I think we're going to see a not insignificant amount of uh, fin fiscal stress, you know, financial stress in these countries. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't get the road or the bridge. So one can't say there isn't a benefit. There is a benefit. And the needs for those kinds of projects was great and it is great. So the question isn't, do you do those kinds of projects, but can you do them in a way that does more, you know, has more benefit and less cost? Now, hopefully from China's perspective, you know, if there were a global effort to try and reach higher standards, um, that would actually be something that would bring China to compete at a higher level. I know when I engaged with China in, in an official capacity, I always made that case to them. You know, you're, if you, the higher the standards you meet, the better you're going to do. Um, partially because there was no competition, there was no real pressure. And China did business in a way that, you know, in some ways met the, what was the path of least resistance in the countries they went to. If you go into a country where there's a fair amount of corrupt practices, if you have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that makes it very hard to do business, that's not as attractive as if you come in and don't ask a lot of questions. Have you done good for the country by not asking any questions? I don't think so. You're leaving behind uh, considerable problems around whatever the investment was. So I think it's a little harder to answer the question from a China-centric perspective. But I think from a U.S. and global perspective, um, you know, it, it you know, net uh, the conclusion is uh, you know, it, it warrants concern because there are substantial um, uh, uh, collateral costs. Aren't the countries who participate able to make a decision as to whether or not it's in their interest to to have a power plant built or have a port? expanded or I mean it's, it's an interesting it's, question Steve uh, I, I think the answer clearly is yes they have the ability and David may want to jump in a little bit but the non-transparency of the financing terms um, isn't necessarily uh, clear in the case of each country going in that they went in fully cognizant of the consequences or how to compare it on net terms with other options that might have been available either from commercial Western lending or through other support from other countries. If the report talks about that most of this financing is not concessionary. No, it's not concessionary. That it ends up being, so these, you know, these countries that accept, the, that take on this debt are making a rational decision that it's worth it. So in, that in they world, need to get electricity to their people, that they need to have a transportation system that works, that they need high speed rail. Now, clearly there is a, a desire to invest uh, in the areas where uh, BRI loans went. Uh, you know, right at the outset, I said the need preceded BRI and BRI provided a funding mechanism. Um, it, it's not um, uh, a funding mechanism that has produced financially sustainable conditions in uh, an awful lot of countries. And that's a problem. And you, you can say, would, would countries knowingly go into a situation where um, after a very short period of time, they wouldn't be able to service the debt? 
you know, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Clearly, if you don't have power, you'll do an awful lot to get a power plant. Um, if, if, if the only uh, power plant you can afford is a coal plant, and the one that China is offering to finance is a coal plant, you may end up with a problem for 20, 30, 50 years afterwards. The question is, I mean, it, 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 what is the US and what is the global community, what are the international financial institutions doing to meet these needs in a way that provides alternatives. The goal, you know, we say in, in a number of places, it's not to compete dollar for dollar. It's to make sure through things like technical support that countries have the ability to ask all the questions and understand what they're what they're doing. And secondly, to make sure there are alternatives. Can I add just one really quickly? Yeah. One point is that you know we now have a lot of information um, from a, a sort of related study on the exact terms of the contracts that China has been lending, and a couple of things that I think are important to note. One is that China has been trying to do this very much in secret and very much on a one-to-one -one basis. So, I mean, Steve, your question premises with don't these countries know? Um, and the answer, I think, to that question in many instances is no, because they don't have the ability to talk about any of these terms or to compare notes with one another or to find out what another country did in a particular contract. And I say that for two reasons. I mean, one, interestingly, in one instance, US as economists, diplomats, and lawyers in Myanmar were allowed to go in and provide this kind of technical assistance with respect to a particular port. And they were able to get the price down from $7.3 billion to $1.3 billion. So by just helping you know, Myanmar understand what are you paying for, what are you getting, what are the terms, there was, again, this huge decrease in the price. But if we look at the actual loan contracts, they have extremely strong confidentiality requirements, which are unusually putting the burden on the country, not on the lender, on the creditor to not disclose any of the terms. All of the contracts that were looked at have an absolute mandate that you may not engage in debt renegotiation through the Paris Club or anything else that brings other parties into the contracts. So China, I think, very expressly was trying, Steve, to not let there be sort of knowledge, if you will, or an understanding about what was a fair lending term for this kind of a project, what should those contracts look like. Um, and they added into these clauses this notion that you have to set up a separate, in essence, bank account, uh, which, again, is to make sure that China is first in line if there should be a default. And secondly, it's not public then. So even though this is in theory public debt, you know those kind of transactions are not known uh, to the publics in many of the BRI countries. And then if I just could add one final uh, small point, but there is of course the, the question of corruption. And I think that your question is also uh, premised on the assumption that these leaders are acting in the interests of their country as a whole. But what you find in BRI, if you look at Malaysia, um, if you look at other cases, right, China does capture the elites here, and it works with the leaders to help grease their political patronage networks, and they cut deals that are not necessarily economically sustainable or viable, um, but they help them with their political base, also happened in Sri Lanka, uh, helps them get reelected, and you know, frankly, also can can end up with money in their pockets. How many EU members are 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 BRI parties? Uh, two thirds of the member states of the European Union are members. And, and of BRI. they're not capable of negotiating loan agreements. I mean, come on, that that's even if you don't have access to what others have negotiated, these are people who've negotiated loan agreements for. Decades and decades, they have access to the best law firms in the world, and they can't do it. Well, again, all I'm saying is, you know, what we're seeing in the contracts with uh, CDB and with Exim that they are pretty standard. Con in other words, they've created a standard contract, and they're basically, to some degree, in the take it or leave it mode of these contracts. And the contracts again have these somewhat unusual clauses, but that China is insisting on. Interesting. And, and Steve, I, I think you really have to go back to what what choices do they see? And, and one of the things we do in the recommendations is we go through how some of the U.S. credit programs, the international financial credit programs, could be more effective than they've been in terms of being seen side by side as alternatives. But I do I think even in sophisticated countries, the transparency issues, the, the confidentiality of these agreements 
makes them opaque in terms of decision making. Um, it, 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 the other it, thing I would also say is, in many instances, as um, others have pointed out, there's no one there to offer the alternative, and yeah. so there's something that you need, um, and there's no other option, or the it's a very protracted process. Uh, then I think people will make a decision uh, to fulfill the need that they have, and I think that's where the that that we have come up short in not being able either by ourselves or working with other countries to put together cooperative agreements and options for countries to consider. And I think it's actually worth also focusing. One of the things that I think is not happening is China's not coming in and seizing projects um, on, on any kind of a regular basis. It's not as if they're establishing ports or Chinese ports because loans have gone bad. Um, they renegotiate, extend terms of loans, but as Jennifer said, it's not through a, a, a formal mechanism like the Paris Club. You know, because China's lending goes through the commercial banks, not through government entities that are formal government entities, even though they're state-owned enterprises, they're kind of in a gray area. We've been trying for a very long time to have China step into the kind of world where they participate in Paris Club processes. But you, you think about the dynamics of a loan going bad and the international community bailing a country out. And here you have international financial institutions, the United States and other Western countries being asked for support. And the, the commercial loan for a BRI project would be at the top of the list to be repaid. That's not a, a viable uh, uh, long-term way for the two largest countries in the world to relate to each other commercially. Well, you, you you as well. Having spent my early career negotiating these deals, um, you know, as a lawyer, the, the question, if you're not disclosing, the question is going to be the enforceability of that provision, that it's almost effectively you're not having a secured interest that's going to give you the, the, the priority in the debt. And it's going to be renegotiated, exactly what Jack said, it's going to be renegotiated. So I'm not sure if these Chinese policies are ultimately going to redound to their benefit or detriment. If it's not disclosed, then other creditors are going to say, wait a minute, we didn't know this. We wouldn't have made this loan on this basis. And given the project is in the local government, it's not in China, it's in the local government. The ability to enforce those are going to be, are going to be very problematic. Let's go on to ports, because I, I think, you know, right before we, we started this, you know, the, the port in Sri Lanka, Gary, has kind of uh, those who think BRI is, is a deeply strategic um, kind of risk for the United States have pointed to that port. Talk about, and, and the fact that it's now kind of gone to the Chinese, talk about kind of what has gone on there and what the real risks are for the United States. Yeah. I, th I think one of the, the issues, and I'll let uh, David get into a lot of the particulars on the ports, but particularly in the Indian Ocean, I think that um, that, that China has put in place some, some significant maritime infrastructure um, uh, aligned against their Asian strategic rival, India. If you look at port facilities in uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, and Gwadar, that, that makes the Indians uh, quite nervous. But I, I think that, um, th that as you look at the spread of the ports and, and Hamban Toda, I, I, I'm going to put in a separate category, but um, you know, they, they took a small port in Greece. It's now the, the fourth largest port in Europe. Uh, and from that, there are other opportunities that China uh, has. So uh, I think it's how they've spread them out. Uh, there, many of them are in very, very strategic locations. Um, and and I, I think it's been a very clear strategy of building out on this maritime infrastructure. But David, if you want to uh, provide some color on Hambantota, please do. Well, I mean, Hambantota has really gotten a lot of attention because it's kind of the poster child for the notion that uh, BRI is all about debt trap diplomacy. 
that essentially China goes in, loads countries with debt that it knows it won't be able to repay with the ultimate goal of eventually seizing an asset. And of course, this might sound just like a, a technical difference, but right, it hasn't seized Hanban Tota. It has a 99-year lease on that port. So it hasn't actually taken over that asset yet. But as we note in the report, there is the question of whether a debt trap would even be in China's interest, right? It incurs big reputational costs. And now Hanban Tota is kind of stood up as the, uh, as the reason why countries should not get involved in BRI. So one, would arg one could argue, I think, that China's better off if it has successful BRI projects. And actually, Hanban Tota has been more of a burden than a benefit from the Chinese perspective. Um, and then, of course, there are, are other factors that, uh, that, are the, that are specific to Hanban Tota, that it, first of all, the project predated BRI. Of course, Sri Lanka has economic issues that also predate China's lending and its activity there. So I think that it's, it's unfortunate this, that this narrative of debt traps has taken hold. And we did try to, um, in our report, kind of uh, be a little bit more um, careful about how we describe China's lending approach with BRI. Um, a question comes in exactly on this, which is from uh, one of our, actually one of our uh, staff, uh, Natai writes, research from Deborah Brodigan uh, shows that Chinese banks are willing to restructure the terms of existing loans that have never actually, exactly what, what uh, Jack said, have never actually seized an asset from any country, much less the port. Uh, how does this example often held up as the example of debt tap, debt trap diplomacy square, square with the reality of what's actually happened and what this means for the broader narrative here. Let me start and then David and Jennifer can take over. The, 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 the you know, kind of uh, horror story that people worry about is the seizure and change of ownership. And, and there are other consequences to this kind of um, excessive indebtedness you know, that are more subtle than that. There's um, the influence that China has over other countries you know, when there are differences of views in the global community and, and uh, a country needs China to be responsive in a debt negotiation. There are, um, you know, terms that can be extended that make it a longer term, deeper financial relationship, um, you know, that, that, that has consequences both in terms of finances and in terms of geopolitics. Um, and the issues that Gary was raising in terms of access to information, you don't need to own the facility to see what's going on uh, in it, above it, underneath it, through it. Um, but David, did you want to maybe say a, a few words about uh, the, the restructuring uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, we actually do have a, a chart in our report on this. And, and one thing to note is that China rarely writes off the debt. So it, it does restructure it, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, and it's willing to extend the term or, or renegotiate, but it, but it doesn't view this as aid, right? China views this as a commercial enterprise, and therefore it's unwilling to just write off the debt if a country is facing, is facing hardship, and, that, and that's an issue that we, we talk about. It. And, and to go to Jack's earlier point, just very briefly, you know, we we tend to look as, are they seizing something or not seizing something? Are they taking over a port or other related infrastructure? But as we point out in the politics section of our report, I think the Chinese influence is much more subtle than that. And so if you look at the case of Pakistan, for instance, right? Pakistan was the, uh, was the number one kind of BRI example that China wanted to put over the world, $62 billion of commitments. Well, now Imran Khan is silent on what's happening in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, right? Has China taken over anything in Pakistan? No. But has it influenced the political discourse at an elite level in Pakistan? I'd say likely. And, and there are other examples that we point to in the report that are very similar. So, uh, you know, and this goes back to um, putting pressure on Cambodia to veto uh, the South China Sea resolution in ASEAN unrelated to BRI, but I think that it's important to understand that that's kind of China's broader geoeconomic playbook and BRI is a really critical element of that. 
not unlike what the United States does with its allies in multilateral fora. So, uh, you know, I think we need to be careful on our criticism of that. Um, Jennifer, your the, the digital kind of BRI. Uh, I mean, you talked about the huge numbers of unbanked and that Ali and others are starting to penetrate those markets. Again, when I kind of grew up, unbanked was really bad. And the ability to kind of have access through a, a phone is wonderful. It also reduces corruption enormously in these, in these countries, in Pakistan and in India, in other places where if money flows through intermediaries, it's basically, there's a, a portion of it is taken in corruption. So why is this not a good thing? And Ali is, is actually at war with the Chinese government. So there's a real divide between Ali and the, you know, the fine that they've put on, on Ant Financial, the, obviously the, the restrictions they've put on Jack Ma suggest that this is not the Chinese government. So again, I, I think the report is pretty clear. We're not suggesting just because China is doing it, it's bad. I mean, the whole gist of the report is there's a whole lot of good reasons for China to be doing BRI. And there's an awful lot of, you know, again, helpful development. And in the technology space, there is no question that China is bringing technology, um, including financial technology, to countries that have not had it and that need it. Um, and so the overall gist is there's a lot of good there. The problem for, I think, what we're recognizing for the United States in the financial technology area is, is a couple of things. One is whether there are, again, maybe not with Ant, but with other aspects of financial technology, links into the Communist Party that make it hard for us to see how this, this uh, again, how we, we can fit into this or how we fight back on it. For example, blockchain ledgering, which is, again, one of the things that you absolutely need in the financial tech space, if you will, to do everything from mine your bitcoins to think to think about how you're processing all of these financial transactions. Well, China has now set up its own blockchain network, but it is controlled, unlike all of the other blockchain ledgering out there that is supposed to be independent and free. It is directly connected to the Chinese Communist Party. You now have, again, the development of a digital currency in China, which is, again, done through, if you will, the Communist Party. So some of it is what it is doing in terms of our ability to compete in these other markets. Uh, when China starts to become such a dominant player um, in the FinTech space and in the technology space more generally, whether that presents a sort of insurmountable uh, hurdle for any US companies to be able to compete in those markets. Secondly, whether it's giving China just, uh, and particularly the Communist Party, eyes into every transaction, eyes on every movement of every renminbi everywhere um, in a way that presents ultimately security risks, you know, is, is another one of the issues that clearly gets raised in this space. And the third is the actual technology standards themselves, you know, for the software, for 5G, for the, you know, the individual technologies that makes one piece operate with another piece within these systems. And that's the third place where China has basically taken over the International Technology, U technology Standards Union, the ITU, the International Standard Setting Organizations. You know, again, the head of it is a Chinese national. If you look at the standard submissions 20,000 submissions from Huawei alone to set standards for 5G, whereas the United States, you know, is down there, at, you know, less than 2,000 submissions. So the standards themselves around all of this technology and all of these apps and all of this software are being written sort of by and for Chinese companies and Chinese technology. And it makes it very hard to imagine how the US can ever come into that segment of the market because we no longer have the ability to sort of plug and play where you can insert a US component or a US app or a US piece of software into this system that is now in essence entirely written by, by and for China. So the, 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 the basic premise is exactly what the BRI report says writ large, which is yes, it is very good that all of these people that have been unbanked are now banked. That is a good and laudable goal. And you are absolutely correct. It is bad to have too many unbanked people out there. It is much harder to be poor and unbanked. So yes, China is doing a very good thing in offering the financial technology that it is. It's just the manner in which it is doing it um, is presenting all of these risks. Yeah, but, but what I'm pointing out in the 
relationship between Ali and the regulatory authorities, between Ant and the regulatory authorities, that viewing this as a monolith, viewing this as all controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, leads to wrong right. policy conclusions. That it may be perfectly okay for Ali to go in and provide this kind of technology without, you know, I don't see examples. I mean, this is something I was going to ask Gary of the exfiltration of data. You know, the Trump administration claimed that TikTok and, and uh, you know, TikTok was up exfiltrating all this data. Well, it doesn't look like they were. And that, that block on them was really ineffective. But it's, it's viewing um, China as a monolith. And you say the Chinese Communist Party is controlling the digital currency. Well, indirectly, I, I guess. But in fact, it's an initiative from the People's Bank of China. Um, you know, which is by and large, Jack's dealt with them over the years, you've dealt with them, Jennifer. Um, they're a pretty responsible organization. Um, you know, ultimately, if they're told by the Chinese Communist Party they need to do X, Y, and Z, they will do it. But they'll kind of, you know, they, they, they behave kind of like central bankers. Yeah, and Steve, uh, there's nothing in the report that contradicts the kind of general view that in, in dealing with, say, the leadership of the People Bank, People's Bank of China, you know, you're dealing with counterparts uh, who are at a world level. That's a different question from is the technology designed in a way that provides a, an opportunity for it to be used uh, the way Jennifer is describing. That, that's really the issue. Um, it, it's not, uh, it, 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 it doesn't have to be the case that it's put in place to immediately have that effect. But if it blocks um, other uh, technologies from being used, and if in a moment of conflict, it provides an avenue for the data to be used in, in, a, in a way that uh, could be harmful to others, that's something you would seek to avoid. And again, the report doesn't say you know, China was wrong to see a void. There was a big void. The recommendations are about filling that void creating alternatives, having international standards for interoperability. You know, when we get to 6G, having it be a jump ball, what technology can compete for 6G and having the U.S. invest in the R&D to have technology or work with uh, a, a European or a, 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 another technology uh, to be an alternative. So yeah. it's really, it's, it's about competing as opposed to condemning. I guess the reason I raise these questions is where, you know, I thought that, as I had said, the report is fabulous and it's a must read for folks who are focused on US China relations, an absolute must read. Where I guess where I have a slight difference is I would have focused more on the areas of cooperation, where we could kind of work with the Chinese to do some of these things which are good for the world. You know, bringing electricity to people is good. Bringing telecommunications is good. Having more efficient ports is good. Where we could find ways that U.S. companies can work with them. In fact, I see a question from Yuema, who's over at, uh, I think, Chubb. Uh, American companies, i.e. banks, investors, and EPC contractors, have from time to time participated in BRI projects quite profitably in most cases. Would you encourage or discourage American firms from continuing to participate in those opportunities? Uh, uh, on that point, uh, Stephen, I'll let uh, Jennifer and David uh, give you some stats on it. But when you look at uh, American firm involvement or non-Chinese uh, firm involvement, the numbers are, are pretty telling. David or Jennifer, do you wanna pick up on that? Well, again, what we do know is that of the BRI contracts that have been out there from what we can get the data on, 89% of them have been awarded to Chinese companies, notwithstanding, you know, the pledge that these BRI projects would be available to everyone. And, and the sort of significant telling point in some ways is if you will, the issue of, I don't want to say American branding, but at some level it comes back to that where what we are seeing is that to the extent that American companies are participating in BRI projects, it's, it's generally as a sub or subcontractor, which has two implications. One is um, it means they have very little ability to influence the overall 
uh, to, uh, you know, provisions of the contracts. So they're not a, in a position to insist that there be an environmental impact statement done in advance of the project. They're not able to really shape some of the major contours of the project because they are sub or sub or sub contractors. And then, you know, the 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 second issue that that then comes up with that um, is this issue of American branding. Uh, again, if you if you ask you know, again, there's survey data that is reflected in the report, you know, in, in areas of the world where the United States is still by far the largest source of foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia, in Africa, where the actual truthful American presence is very significant, but yet you ask people who is the most significant economic player in the region, the answer is China. China and China, and it's because of BRI, uh, where again, the image, the brand, if you will, that's come out of BRI is uh, sort of dominating in that sense. So again, in answer to the question, to me, the answer to, the, to this lender of should you participate in BRI is honestly the same as all others, it depends. You know, if it's a good contract at a, you know, that is that has a reasonable chance of earning uh, an e economic return that is not going to cause environmental damage, that is going to provide some amount of skills transfer to the local workforce such that overall it is a good project, sure. Uh, but if it's going to be adding to another coal-fired plant, maybe not. And I think that's where alternatives actually can lead to cooperation. Because if in fact, and, and let's take a port project as, a, as an example, if, if it were a much more competitive process, the, the recipient country may say, okay, I like the design that the Chinese want to do with some of the physical infrastructure, but I want to go with either a, 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 a Japanese or a European uh, firm on the control mechanisms for how we move containers around and, and, and move uh, product. And I think that that uh, allows uh, for opportunities to cooperate, but it also has the potential of putting it on a level playing field. And, and to be clear, when we, when we in the report look at things like technology standards, um, our criticism is the United States stepped away from engagement in setting those standards, in, 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 in being at the table. You know, we don't say China shouldn't be at the table. We say that there ought to be a competitive environment and the United States has to be a player and a leader. As a US government policy, as a Biden administration policy, we should make it a part of our policy to, to simply insist the Chinese be more transparent and more open to foreign yeah. participation in these projects that the caterpillars and the Bechtels and those who kind of would ordinarily be involved in these globally are there. And if they have facilities, well, Bechtel doesn't, but CAT would have a production facility in a lot of the BRI countries, they should have an advantage in providing the, you know, the tractors and, the, and everything else. I mean, it, we need, you know, it, it, look, it's, it's, you know, we need to re-engage with the world, <laughs> which I think we're doing. Uh, we've got dozens of questions and I will get highly criticized if I don't go to these questions. So let me, um, let me go to one from Ben Lewis at GW, who says, will the PRC ever choose to use the PLA to protect its BRI investments, such as protecting the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam from a potential Egyptian attack once it's completed? That's for Gary, I think. Yeah, um, I always avoid questions like, "Will they ever do something?" Um, that's a that's a that's a long shot. Uh, I would say that the the PRC is going to be very reluctant to use the PLA to guard infrastructure uh, in foreign countries. Um, I, I just think that that is not the way that they will approach it. I think that they will use other means of influencing the environment to potentially make it more secure. But I, I uh, in my engagement with the PLA over 30 years, um, I, I think it's going to be some time before we would see uh, in a non-peacekeeping role, uh, the PLA out and about. Now, one of the things that they could do is label it as, you know, we're there to maintain peace and we have troops, but I do not believe that they would 
take the same approach as we have done with our military to guard infrastructure in other countries. This one for Jennifer, I think, um, from Director of Private Equity at the Public School Employees Retirement System of Pennsylvania, Darren Foreman. How do you keep hold China accountable for any aspect of ESG? What options does the West have? That's a great question. Thank you. I mean, I think what the report recommends is a number of things, and it starts with sort of working with a whole group of our allies to try to insist on a couple of things. One is that China is more transparent about the lending that it's doing. The second would be that uh, that it do pre-project environmental assessments of, of every project uh, and, that, and that it follow through with something that China set up, which is this uh, BRI coalition uh, that is designed to do a couple of things. One, this coalition has come up with what they're calling red light, yellow light, green light sort of projects. And the projects that have, you know, sort of significant environmental damages that cannot be mitigated. They put into this red light sort of category. And again, the issue is encouraging China to live up to those where it starts to phase out and ultimately ceases to fund uh, the projects that are on the red light area. So a lot of it is live up to the promises that you made in, in this BRI initiative. And then the two other things that are really important. One is to develop, again, internationally agreed upon standards for what constitutes a green investment. Because right now what China says is as long as the project meets the environmental standards of the country in which the investment is being made, and many of those countries have low or poor environmental standards, it falls into the green category. So it's got to be changing either the the BRI host country environmental standards, or it's got to be setting more importantly its own standards for what constitutes um, for what constitutes an, an international agreement. So again, the, there's a whole series of things that are in the in the category of pressuring China to live up to international standards and, and to those. On the flip side of it is the United States, and obviously its partner simply has to do more to offer these alternatives. I mean, during the Obama administration, we put together this very successful Power Africa model of bringing together public, private, um, you know, NGOs and a community to power Africa in a very much more renewable way. That's the kind of model that the United States, I think, now needs to take more global and into a number of these other markets in order to offer some genuine green alternatives uh, to, to what China's offering. So this one is CalPERS from uh, Louis Zahorik, uh, who's investment director at CalPERS. It's unusual we have people from the public employee retirement systems on the call, especially two in this case. Um, this could be, well, for any of you, describe how escalation in policy would occur uh, between the US and China trade, currency, militarily, which would then kind of affect um, you know, China's BRI. That we could have a whole program on that, but somebody, David, you wanna take that for in one minute? I'll let Gary take this one. Well, I, I, on the um, escalation, and I'll stay in the military lane, um, I, I think that this is an area where we are involved in a region where missteps could easily occur. And, and I think we would be off to the races there. Uh, I do think that in a more protracted escalation, um, as, as we see China uh, being more assertive uh, with its military, particularly regionally. We're seeing it around Taiwan, where in my view, they're just wearing out uh, the Taiwanese uh, Air Force and Navy. We're seeing it in the Philippines, where they're flooding the zone, if you will. Um, and, and I think in, in situations like that, uh, wearing down another country's resolve, testing the US resolve, I think has the potential to um, uh, allow China to, to be more of a leader in the region and, and beyond. But I'll turn to Jack on the economic uh, yeah. policy escalation. Steve, as, as you know well, you know, economic relations over the last 50 years have been the medium through which people have gotten to know each other and develop some trust and uh, how the United States and China have, have avoided conflict. The fact that we're coming out of a period of intense uh, economic uh, 
competition to conflict um, kind of hangs over this. Um, you know, I think in both the United States and China right now, the domestic political environments are very difficult in terms of kind of quickly resolving that. You've heard me say this in other settings, but I think it's true here as well. I actually think it's in multilateral transnational discussions that there's the space to start rebuilding uh, the ability to work together, particularly where we have common interests. So on climate, to pick up on the point that Jennifer was just making, if we're both engaged in the next round of climate discussions, and if coming out of that, China is part of an agreement where it won't just control carbon emissions in China, but where what it does through BRI is going to also be subject to that agreement, that leads to a deconfliction and the ability to work together. There are other issues like that, not all having to do with BRI, but you take the, 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 the health area. It makes no sense for the world, for China and the United States to not work together on either broad global health issues, particularly you know, now as we are still in a pandemic. Uh, finding a way in the WHO to work together as opposed to uh, oppositionally. I actually think that the, if you imagine making some progress in that multilateral se setting where you know, it's not just the US and China, but the nations of the world, and China remains committed to being involved in this space, their involvement uh, can be actually more constructive and less likely to lead to conflict. So I actually think you can uh, work through a lot of these issues, but I think you, know, you can't um, um, uh, ignore the fact that we're in a place where neither side wants to be seen domestically as giving any, any room. And it means that things have to be done uh, mutually. The, um, we have, uh, many Americans associate uh, BRI with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Fund uh, Bank, and if if um, God, if this were the Bible, uh, I would say in the beginning there was AIIB, and America decided not to participate, and it started us down a, low, uh, a road that has led us to where we are. Jack, you were obviously Secretary of the Treasury at that time when when the Obama administration made that decision and kind of also spoke with our allies about how to participate. Can you shed yeah. some light on that? Well, the AIB is not formally part of the Belt and Road Initiative, but obviously it was initiated at the same time and was part of China's developing a much more active uh, presence uh, in spaces where the US had been a leader, uh, both of international financial institutions and of direct assistance. Um, you got to put AIB in the setting of the time. It was it came about at a time when the United States was the only country in the world that hadn't ratified uh, international monetary funding uh, uh, changes that would have increased the you know the shares of developing uh, emerging economies. Um, it took us five years to get that through Congress. So it, there was the sense that the United States wasn't doing its part, and we can go into the politics of that separately. The idea that the United States was going to engage in a new international financial institution like AAIB at a time when it couldn't, it took five years to keep the commitment to fund the IMF, it was kind of a non-starter. There wasn't the ability to follow through on a commitment like that. The issue from our perspective was how do you make sure if there's going to be a new international financial institution and if the United States is not going to be a part of it, that it has standards that are befitting an international financial institution in the tradition of the last 70 years. The message from the United States to countries in Asia, in Europe, around the world was your moment of influence to set high standards is on the way in insist that it be an institution that is governed by high standards. And by and large, they succeeded in doing that. Um, it, 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 uh, it, you know, there, there were some dynamics to the way countries signed on that were less than flattering in terms of kind of first mover advantage and making moves that were somewhat 
uh, jarring to traditional friends. But in the end, the strategy actually was a successful one in that the major countries that joined insisted that AI be a B institution with standards on environment, on, on local uh, sustainability, et cetera. And the proof to me is that for the first four or five years of AIB's existence, almost all of its activity, if not all of its activity, was working on projects that also went through the World Bank or the Asia Development Bank, which actually had those standards, so they were bootstrapped into AIB. If we were talking about that pattern on the Belt and Road Initiative, frankly, we probably would be celebrating you know, an alleviation of a lot of problems as opposed to highlighting the risks that we're talking about. And to some extent, the recommendations that we're proposing are not that dissimilar from what I just described as the goal with AAIB. It's not to have China not be engaged. It's to do it in a way that meets high standards. It's so interesting that the report really does highlight that American disengagement has has um, so opened this door in so many ways, and it, it's it's so true. I saw one of the recommendations, which of course I wholeheartedly agree, and it's only my Don Quixote uh, personality that gets me to agree, which is rejoining the TPP or the CPTPP today, uh, which I think is a great in a lot of ways. Had we joined, and I'm sure Jennifer could comment, had we joined the TPP back then, the result you know, would have been probably somewhat different. The door wouldn't have been left so wide open as it, as it was. Do you agree with that, Jennifer? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And clearly the report reflects that. And at the same time, I think the report is trying to reflect the political reality that probably saying right now, right out of the box, Biden administration, you should join the CPTPP is not realistic. And so what the report does say is maybe start um, with a sectoral agreement and the report recommends that that sectoral agreement be in the digital space uh, to create a strong digital agreement, potentially piggybacking off of the US-Japan digital agreement uh, to set up, you know, again, a very strong pan-Asian agreement that the United States could be a part of uh, that sets high standards. Again, going back, I think Jack is exactly right, uh, because even during the course of the writing of this report, you know, one of the things that happened was the creation of RCEP, the Regional Cooperative uh, Economic Partnership among China, uh, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Korea, and then all of the 10 na nations of the ASEAN. Uh, and again, that is going to create a significant pull, this creating of the hub that David was describing earlier with China very much being at the hub. And the United States is simply not present um, in any of the architecturally important trade agreements that are occurring in Asia. We're not part of CPT and we're not part of RCEP. And that does leave the United States sort of on the outside looking in in a way that is not in our long term future. Stephen, if I could add, I think that by not being part of it, it's unbalance the strategic thrust that we need in Asia and beyond. And what it has left us with is uh, a more apparent military component. And I think that that is not helpful um, because we need both and we need the balance. Uh, we need to be able to work economically and influence others in, in that way and assist others in that way. And we walked away from it. And I think it was a huge strategic misstep. The last question, because we're out of time, 24 people on this task force. Uh, it's somewhat like herding cats. What was the toughest issue to achieve consensus on? Anybody want to take that one? Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jennifer and David, because they were the ones that were trying to bring everybody together. Well, I mean, I think it gets back to kind of the point you raised, which is, um, you know, what, what are China's intent, intentions with the technology, for instance, Huawei? Is this part of a kind of master plan and a grand geostrategic vision to, um, to collect intelligence, to spread military power? And if you look at a lot of the rhetoric out of the Trump administration, it was describing BRI as you know, a Trojan horse for advancing China's security interests. So I think that there was this kind of, I don't want to call it a tension, but uh, a question of is BRI primarily motivated by economic factors and should we see it as a uh, economic undertaking 
or is that all just a cover for advancing China's um, security interests around the world and also spreading uh, the digital Silk Road so that it can collect intelligence and have leverage during a conflict? And I think, as it was clear in the report, we lead off with economics, and that was intentional. And I also think that economics was uh, the largest analytical section that we had, and most of our recommendations are about how to compete with China in the economic realm and how to draw on our, co on our um, comparative strengths in the economic realm. So I think it's pretty clear where we came out on that, but there were certainly people in the group that um, might have thought more that, that BRI is kind of Xi Jinping's grand geostrategic initiative um, with security at the top and economics uh, below and subordinate to it. Jennifer, anything? I, I wouldn't change a, a word of that. I mean, I think that was the underlying tension there and, and that filtered also into the question of how far and in what direction do the recommendations go? Because obviously if you think of BRI as this you know, entirely geostrategic, then your recommendations are in that direction. And so that was the other part of it was to, to, to we, we thought to keep our recommendations to actually addressing honestly what we thought were the risks that were created by BRI and not to try to address uh, China policy writ large or, or China on a much grander scale. I mean, that was one of the real difficulties also was to try to keep the report in the lane of Belt and Road, even though that lane is not at all subscribed or proscribed um, and kept moving itself. Uh, the, the attempt was really to try to stay focused on the actual genuine risks from BRI and to address those. And to give credit to, to the drafts people, um, it's very easy to slip from saying what a risk of what might happen is to what will happen is and being predictive and having predictions be reflective of malign motives. I think if you read the report, it doesn't have that tone. It's very analytic. It's written about what are the things we should be concerned about? What can we do about it? Um, and I think that that's actually something that's going to have it be more enduring because it rises above some of the, the kind of loud rhetoric um, that we're hearing on both sides now. And I would uh, add that I think what the, what the report conveys is um, not that um, we're there to, to uh, you know, trip China as an opponent. We have to run faster in this race where there are real consequences uh, for prosperity and security in the future. This time has flown by. We are out of time. And, um, you know, this is a council report. I follow the council traditions of, of starting promptly and ending promptly. But um, thank you for giving so generously of your time this afternoon. I see our audience stayed with us every second. No, virtually nobody has disconnected. Um, and thank you for really writing this report. It's a real contribution to way, the way we should be thinking about China about US-China relations, about the effect of BRI on us. But it's terrific. Thank you all and thank the audience for joining us on this beautiful spring afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you, thanks.